I work for the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District in the southern part of Florida. Uh, 80s Gyp Dye Control is a big part of our uh, our mission, and uh, obviously uh, we have a lot of quality control uh, issues that we have to address. Uh, first of all, just to let you know, uh, Florida Mosquito Control, it's mandated by state law, Chapter 3 of the Florida Statutes, but it's organized at the county level. Uh, there are 67 counties in Florida. Most of them have at least one mosquito control program. Uh, some of them have uh, two. Uh, there are some that don't have any. And at the county level, the people decide whether or not they want mosquito control. And some people don't, and most people do. We ourselves are an independent taxing authority, but we have oversight by the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Uh, we have an elected board of commissioners, people from the community actually run for elected office and they oversee our, uh, they set policy and oversee uh, the governance of the district. Uh, we're an interesting district. We're about 120 miles long, 193 kilometers from east to west and about almost five kilometers wide from north to south at the widest point. We're an island chain. Basically, we're an archipelago of islands that's found southeast, south, and southwest of the mainland Florida. Most of the islands are in Monroe County. A few are up in Miami-Dade County where uh, Isha Kunlu, who's at the conference there, her, her agency uh, deals with that county. And basically, this is a map. This is the southern part of Florida. All these islands in yellow are the Florida Keys. Uh, this is the city of Key West way out here. This is the upper part of Key Largo. There are a couple smaller islands that you really can't see due to the scale of the map. That's Elliott Key, which is in uh, Miami-Dade County. The way we're organized, I mean, as I mentioned, we have an elected board of commissioners. Uh, they set policy and our executive director uh, administrates policy. The administrative director has uh, people who report directly to her. We have a, a director of operations. She supervises our area supervisors who supervise field inspectors. There's also, because we have uh, a lot of trucks and other machinery, we have a mechanic supervisor mechanics, a ULV coordinator who coordinates our ultra low volume uh, pesticide uh, treatments from the trucks. We have three different offices because our island chain is so long. One is in Big Coppet Key near, near Key West. One is in Marathon office where I work in the middle of the island chain. And one is up in Key Largo, close to the peninsula. And then we have uh, some people who only do uh, ULV spraying. They don't work for us full time, they're on call. My position, I'm director of research. There are three research biologists uh, beneath me, one in each office. Uh, to conduct uh, research on mosquito problems specific to that area. And below them are uh, surveillance technicians who do some of the more routine things like setting traps and retrieving traps. Uh, we also have an executive ass uh, assistant, director of human resources, safety coordinator, tech officer, basically runs IT. PEIO is public education and information officer. This is the individuals when the people from the media and the public have questions. We send them all to him. He's uh, trained in journalism and he handles all the public inquiries. Um, this group of people here handles the uh, more of the administrative and business aspects of the organization. We do have a director of finance, all the finances. He's under a purchasing agent and fiscal assistant. And then aerial operations, we do have uh, fixed wing and helicopters, aircraft that we do aerial applications of pesticide. We have a director of maintenance, airframe and power plant mechanics, a chief pilot, some staff pilots, support technicians basically do a lot of uh, the mechanic work, uh, mechanical work on the aircraft. And then just like with the spray truck drivers, we have some pilots who are on call. They don't work for us full time, but when we need them, we can call them. So that's our organization. 80s Egypti, which, uh, in this country is referred to as yellow fever mosquito. It's only about 5% of our mosquito population down in the Florida Keys. However, uh, control consumes about 30% of our operational budget. 
you all know, uh, controlling Aedes aegypti is a very labor intensive, uh, very labor intensive undertaking. Uh, the black salt marsh mosquito, Aedes taniarhynchus, it's about 90% of our mosquito population, but these are found out in the salt marshes and the swamps. They migrate into populated areas, but their control is a little more straightforward. Southern house mosquito, Culex cuncofasciatus, that's another about 5% of our mosquito population. This one and Aedes aegypti are you know, found closer to people's homes, obviously. We occasionally see Aedes elopictus and Culex nigropalpus, not very often and not in a lot of localities, but they do show up and they can be pests. Okay, as I mentioned on our organizational site, we have field inspectors. Our inspectors are all given responsibility for a particular area. It may be one island, it may be several islands, it may be a part of an island, depending on the density of housing in that area. Okay, if, if it's an island with not too many people on it, inspectors may be responsible for two or three islands, but in islands that are very densely populated, they may have a half or a third or a quarter of the island. But all mosquito problems in that area are theirs to resolve. So they have to be, resp they have to be responsible, not just for uh, domestic mosquito control, but anything from the salt marshes and anything in between. Adult surveillance, we use the dry ice baited uh, American biophysics trap, uh, similar to the old CDC uh, light trap. We bait these with carbon dioxide dry ice. We also use the Biogent Sentinel. These are more for the uh, Aedes aegypti uh, surveillance because these, uh, these other traps, they'll collect a lot of salt marsh mosquitoes, but Aedes aegypti don't like to go into these traps for some reason, which is the whole reason the Biogent was, was Sentinel trap was invented. These are the black salt marsh mosquitoes. This is what we can get. This is one island, one night. Uh, almost half a million mosquitoes showed up. Uh, this trap was almost falling out of the uh, off the rope because it was so heavy. Um, not as bad, just over 100,000 mosquitoes, but mosquito populations here can get really bad and they can get really bad really quick because we're surrounded by a lot of salt marshes and this upper area, Key Largo, that's right across Florida Bay from the Everglades National Park where no mosquito control is allowed to be done and an interesting aspect of Aedes taniarhynchus biology is they have a migratory dispersal. They'll emerge almost synchronously from the pupil state, millions of adults drying their wings uh, on the vegetation. Then all of a sudden it's time and they start flying and they'll fly into neighborhoods and it, gets, it can get really bad sometimes. Anyway, here's our uh, island chain and all these yellow dots are areas where a light trap or a BG sentinel trap is set weekly. So we do weekly uh, trap collections. Larval surveillance uh, is important. We have to check uh, storm drains in the cities. There are, you know, storm water collection. A lot of these don't go anywhere. They're just big holes in the ground that are lined with concrete and the water sits there until it slowly dissipates. Perfect mosquito habitat. Businesses and residences, people love to keep old containers. Some of these tires have no tread. You know, the steel bands are popping out of the rubber. The people will not throw them away because they might be useful someday. Uh, and then this is a shot from a sewage treatment plant. Our water table is so high uh, and it, we're living on porous coral rock that we really, it's really difficult to have uh, uh, good modern sewage treatment, although we've been mandated by the state to do that. So a lot of places have these above ground sewage treatment plants where the water is treated, but there's big open concrete vaults full of water, which uh, you can see the larvae in the uh, dipper right there. This, these are great places for uh, mosquito, mosquito habitat. As I said, we have aerial applications, fixed wing and rotary aircraft for adult control and ground application by trucks, per, fairly typical. Larval control is more complex. Um, when we have active disease transmission or we have very high Aedes aegypti populations, we will do aerial application of the BTI, 
the WDG. This is a water dispersible granule formulation for Aedes aegypti. We do aerial application of other BTI products for the Aedes tenirhynchus in, in the salt marshes. We have a number of uh, products that we use for hand application for controls and containers. This is uh, one of our biggest challenges, contain, control of containers, homes, you know, people's residences, businesses, cemeteries. Uh, people love to take small vases for flowers and use concrete and cement a little vase onto their uh, family's uh, stone. Now you cannot tip that out. So you've got to uh, treat that and you've got to go through the cemetery pretty much grave by grave checking for uh, larvae. Source reduction, emptying water from containers. And then uh, larvivorous fish in some situations. Now I want to go back. Uh, I think Ishik was telling you about, you know, you can show the people and come back next week and the same containers, we have this exact same situation. You can take somebody out in the yard, show the mosquitoes in the bucket, show the larvae, dump the bucket out in front of the person, tell them this has to remain upside down until you can use it and you can come back a day or two later and they've turned it right side up again. So it's a, it's a never, and people, they'll look at you right in the eye and they will tell you, yes, they understand. And as soon as you leave, you know, leave their yard, they've forgotten. Okay, quality control is important because you all know you can't let mosquito problems get ahead of you. Uh, or you have a hard time catching up. For this is mostly for uh, salt marsh mosquitoes, but also in some cases for the uh, Aedes aegypti and other domestic mosquitoes. We do the trap counts. We, uh, inspectors also take a landing rate count. They'll go back to the same site same position once or twice a week, sometimes in some places daily. And they just stand for a couple minutes, maybe five minutes or so, and they count how many mosquitoes land on them and they record that. We also keep a record of all our service, we're supposed to call them service requests when we talk to the public, but privately we call them complaint calls, people calling in and complaining they have mosquitoes. Uh, our supervisors perform random monthly checks on all inspectors. They'll just, without telling the inspector, they'll go out, they'll follow them. Make sure that they, uh, they'll, do, that they'll do the same inspection that the, uh, that the inspector does. See if they come up with the same numbers. They'll, you know, make sure they can see that there's been a treatment done. Also, our supervisors will randomly ride along with an inspector. They'll just one day walk up to an inspector, say, I'm riding with you today. And they go along in the truck. They gauge the inspector's knowledge of the area their knowledge of the residents, their knowledge of the problems. Uh, the aviation staff does uh, bucket tests and droplet staff, uh, droplet tests to uh, ensure proper operation of equipment and delivery of product. Okay, trap counts, landing rate counts, and service requests. These are not actually independent events that we, they should be consistent and they should agree within reason. If somebody says they're getting a two count on their, landing rate but you've got 150 in the trap there's a discrepancy there service requests we oftentimes send the inspector out to the house to verify because uh people will call about anything they'll call about ceratopagonidae which we do not do treatments for they'll call about chironomidae they'll call about psychotity they'll call about moths lepidoptera they'll call about anything so you have to go out and make sure that there's actually mosquitoes out there because it's actually illegal to do a mosquito control treatment when there's no mosquitoes present. And you have to watch out for what we call chronic complainers, people who will complain all the time. Even if they have no mosquitoes, some people have a mentality, I'm paying for mosquito control, I want to see a truck in my neighborhood every week. And even if you explain there are no mosquitoes, there's no reason to make a treatment. It's illegal to make a treatment. I don't care. I'm paying. I want to see a mosquito truck every week. Supervisors performing random monthly checks on all inspectors. They do expect inspections and treatments. Do product inventories and chemical application records match? The inspectors have to record what product they used, where they used it, and how much. That has to be reported back to the supervisor. And then uh, the product inventory is, is checked to make sure there's not over application or under application. 
Are the chemicals used appropriate ones for the situation? Now the inspectors have to make this decision on their own, but it's checked by the inspect by the supervisor. Are inspections thorough and complete? This is what you know. Sometimes a supervisor will follow and just do another inspection just to make sure things are okay, just to keep the quality check. The supervisors randomly ride along with their inspectors. Uh, are the inspectors familiar with the area? You know. There are some small streets, some neighborhoods that are hidden, places, you know, businesses that might be difficult to get into. Do they know this? Do they interact with the residents? Now, some people don't want to talk to you at all. Some people tell you, I do not want you in my yard. And then we say, well, okay, it's fine. We won't come in. Some people want to keep you there all day and talk about everything, their grandchildren, their dog, their cat. You have to watch out for that. You can spend all day especially some of the older people who are, you know, living by themselves. They love to talk. Are the inspectors aware of problem yards, houses, and businesses? I will tell you this. In every neighborhood, there is always one house. 99% of the people can keep a perfectly clean, no containers, no standing water, no nothing. They do everything perfectly, and there's always one. Are they aware of that? Sometimes it's not a house. Sometimes it's a business. After making the uh, whatever treatment they do, uh, inspectors need to return later that day or the next day to evaluate the treatment. Did it work? Sometimes you do get product failures for whatever reason, uh, and you have to make sure that you know you just can't assume things are working and leave because uh, you will hear about it from the, the citizens. The bucket tests and droplet tests are done by the uh, aviation staff to uh, ensure the proper operation of equipment and delivery of product. We use these here, we call them five gallon, y'all call them 19 liter buckets that collect the product as helicopter flies. This is more for the granular, the granular larva side. You collect and count the pellets in each bucket and this gives you a visualization. You can graph it of the distribution of the product. You're swathed with, and how much uh, product is being delivered. Basically, you string a bunch of buckets across and you fly in this direction and you just pick up, the, you make sure you number the buckets and you pick them up and uh, like I said, you count in your way. And you can figure out, you know, how wide is the, is the swath of granules you're putting out? So how, how, how wide do the uh, helicopter passes need to be together to get adequate coverage? Teflon coated microscope slides. We use these to collect the delta side droplets. You've got to measure at least 100 droplets, calculate the volume, median, diameter. This gives you an index of how much product is being delivered. If you read your label, at least in this country, there are legal standards for how many droplets and what sizes they are. It'll tell you, you know, 90% of your droplets must be between, you know, such and such microns, in, in, and you need to calculate that. Um, this is actually something else. This is not a drop. Well, this was partly, this was a droplet test, but this little device, this woman's holding back here, it's actually a battery powered rotator that spins these slides around. And when the helicopter comes over, uh, dispersing the, uh, pesticide droplets, they'll impinge on these Teflon coated slides. You can take them back and measure them on a microscope. If you don't have this, there's another way to do it that's a little more labor intensive, but it works. You can take a piece of uh, like a broom handle or a mop handle and make a little metal clip that will hold one of these uh, Teflon slides. Then you have to get somebody who's willing to get close enough to the uh, ULV spray to actually swing it hard like a baseball bat or a cricket bat, swing it hard a couple of times through the clouds of droplets and you will collect droplets on the, on the slide and you can do a measurement that way. Uh, we much prefer to do it like this because we put this up, we get out of the way, helicopter comes, then we come back and we pick up the uh, droplets, pick up the slides and measure the droplets. In 80s Egypt eye control or other in domestic situations, the inspectors are required to collect a sample of larvae from each site. They're required to make a tentative identification. What, lar what species of mosquito do they think it is? They record that. They bring the sample into the laboratory where the research staff verifies identification. We want to make sure our inspectors know the difference between uh, Aes aegypti larva and a Culex quinquefasciatus larva. Water quality is different. 
sometimes the product you use has to be different. So th this is very important. And another thing, all of our inspectors, supervisors, managers, research scientists, and directors are required to pass the Florida State Examination for Public Health Pest Control Certification. It is mandatory to pass this in the first year to, for continued employment. And then afterwards, you must attend uh, additional classes or scientific meetings or complete online courses. There are continuing education hours that you must submit to the State Department of Agriculture. It's about every four years to maintain your license. Uh, it's not just a one thing and you're done. You have to, you have to continually, and we provide things for that. We have people come in and do classes here at our district. Uh, back when we were allowed to travel, we would send people to, to you know, mosquito control meetings, that sort of thing. Uh, there's also a week-long mosquito control class that the state association teaches. So there, it, we make it easy for people to pick up those continuing education hours, but they must do that or the state will not uh, renew their license. The chemical inventory. It is independently verified by the safety coordinator. We have one individual who's responsible for safety, looking for safety violations. There are legal standards for workplace safety that must be met. Uh, there are also uh, common sense things that don't seem to be so, so common sense sometimes that this individual looks, looks for. But as far as the chemical inventory, our pest control products, once a month at all three sites, all the liquid pesticides are measured. Granules and pellets, are, we bag them up in bags for the people to take conveniently out to the field. Those are counted by bags, the briquettes and tablets, counted individually, but everything is counted up and reconciled to the usage uh, usage records and to last month's inventory. Okay, so make sure that we keep a strict control. And uh, I didn't mention this in my previous uh, uh, list of quality control, but it's also important to regularly do bottled bioassays with your adulticides to try to head off any uh, incipient problems with uh, resistance. This is not too hard to do, but it's uh, it's time consuming and it takes most of a day. But if you can order the best thing to, there's two ways to do this. You can do this with uh, pure product that you, uh, pure active ingredient rather, that you order from a chemical supply house. There's a couple here that we can order. Or you can do this also with the uh, formulated product. Whatever you're spraying, you can go right out to the, right out to your barrel and take a sample. Make cereal dilutions and you dilute it in the acetone and just make cereal dilutions. And then uh, preferably a minimum of three bottles per dilution you treat uh, with the, uh, with the, dilute, the, the acetone and, and the product. You also wanna make sure you make three uh, acetone only controls. Um, you have to let this, let the acetone evaporate. Uh, Got to go at least a couple of hours. And then what you do is you introduce your mosquitoes and you start recording. We do it every 15 minutes. Some people do it every 10, some do it every five. This many bottles, you go crazy if you're doing anything less than 15 minute intro. But you go ahead and you count uh, how many living mosquitoes are alive, how many are dead, and you can figure out a, a, a curve over time and do that repeatedly and you'll start to get an idea of which mosquito species are responding to which adulticides and how they're responding and then you know you can start to see if there's if there's a problem you, you can detect it sometimes you'll see that they're starting to to die at a higher and higher concentration sometimes it takes longer and longer time for them to die at the same concentration sometimes both things happen but you can do that what's really nice to do really nice to do if you can find somebody somewhere who has a colony of whatever species but in this case it's Aedes aegypti that is known to be susceptible to whatever pesticide you're using we were able to get some eggs from the united states department of agriculture they had a colony that was known susceptible to permethrin which is what we use on our trucks and we were able to test them alongside our own. So, uh, you know, that way we know how a 
completely susceptible strain where it is, is responding and then how our local mosquitoes are responding. That's one interesting thing to know. And then over time, you just keep uh, you know, doing your bottle bioassays and you, you keep a, a handle on uh, resistance. Um, to make these bottles, you have to lay them on their side and roll them with your hands, which gets real tiring real quick. If you can find this, we found a restaurant supply company. This machine back here, um, I don't know what, know what hot dogs are or Vienna sausages, little long sausages that you, we love them here in the United States, going a long bun. But you can cook them with this, this machine actually cooks those sausages. It rotates them slowly. And what you can do is turn the heat off, but turn the roller on. And this thing will roll nine, uh, nine bottles for you at a time. So you can very quickly get uh, all these bottles done instead of having to do them, your, get, you know, a lot of people doing them yourselves. So that's basically what, how, we, how we handle mosquito uh, quality control here. Uh, supervisors uh, follow up on their inspectors. Uh, chemical inventory has to be reconciled. Uh, calibration of your spray equipment has to be done regularly. Uh, verification of uh, species ID that the uh, uh, inspectors are doing. Uh, follow up uh, with uh, reconciling uh, complaint calls, landing rate calls, and uh, trap counts. Uh, just there has to be a system of you know continuous checks and balances back and forth, uh, and following up with the public. And that honestly, that's that can be very frustrating because you know we said. You can take somebody out, show them exactly what to do and how to do it. And I promise you, five minutes after, five minutes, probably five seconds after you walk out the yard, you know, they're worried about what's on television. So uh, I want to thank uh, our, our director of operations, Mrs. Mickey Koss. She uh, was a big help putting this uh, presentation together. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'll answer whatever questions you may have. Uh, Thank you, Larry. I hope that, was, hope that was satisfactory. Thank you, Larry.